Hello, hello everyone. My name is Joan, pronouns are she and her, and uh, I'm a student recruitment officer at Memorial University. And thanks for joining us for our Ask Here Live studio session with the Faculty of Science. So today we have joining with us Dr. Shannon Sullivan and Carter McNelly from the Faculty of Science who are here to answer all of your questions about their undergraduate programs. So before we get started, I just have a couple of housekeeping items to go over. So this session's being recorded. If you're participating, uh, then you're consenting to that. Your mics are muted and your cameras are turned off, so you're only going to be able to see our panelists that are here with us today. But of course, you're not alone. There's other folks on the session and we really want to get your questions submitted to us. So it's important to submit your questions through the question and answer feature to all panelists that sits within the WebEx platform. That's the main reason we're here today, so be sure to send those in. Today's focus, of course, is science, so we're going to keep our questions related to them. And if you do have a question we don't get to, don't worry, we'll follow you up either in a direct message or in an email after the session. So to get us started, I'm going to ask if each of you can tell me a little bit about yourself and your roles within the Faculty of Science. And uh, Dr. Sullivan, you're the first there on my screen. Would you be able to start us off? Absolutely. Thank you, Joan. Uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, I am Dr. Shannon Sullivan, uh, and I play a couple of roles in the Faculty of Science. I'm a teaching term faculty member in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. And so if you do a first or a second year calculus or linear algebra course, I might get the uh, pleasure of teaching you. Uh, but what really brings me here today is that I'm also the senior faculty advisor for the Faculty of Science. And what that means is that I'm the person in the Faculty of Science who's been specifically designated to help incoming and new students who haven't yet reached the point where they've declared a major. Once, so I, I'm able to provide academic advice to for any questions you might have as an incoming or a new student to help you get to that point where you can declare a major. And then we have individual academic advisors in each of our departments who can kind of take over at that point, and they've got the, the more in-depth knowledge of the latter stages of each of our programs, and so they can help you then get through, hopefully, to the point where, where you graduate with a Bachelor of Science. Awesome, thanks Dr. Sullivan for joining us. And Carter? Yeah, um, my name's Carter. I have a much simpler sort of role here. Um, I'm a third year student at Memorial right now. Um, I moved here all the way from Ontario, um, it's not that far, <laughs> um, and I'm currently working towards my bachelor's of science with a major in ocean sciences. And I'm hope to, or I'm I'm going to be happy to answer all of your questions um, as they pop up. <laughs> awesome! Thanks for sharing, Carter. So, folks, just a reminder: it's the Q and A feature to all panelists that we're going to be using to get those questions submitted. The first one that we have that's come in here, I think, would be for Dr. Sullivan. Um, what kind of major areas do you have within the Faculty of Science? Quite a few. Uh, so, every department in the Faculty of Science offers at least one major, and the vast majority of them actually offer several. So, our departments. Let's see. I'll try not to leave any of them out. Uh, we've got biochemistry, biology, chemistry, computer science, earth sciences. Uh, we've got mathematics and statistics, where I'm from, uh, ocean sciences, uh, like Carter mentioned, uh, physics and physical oceanography, and psychology. Uh, we also offer Bachelor of Science with majors in economics and geography, even though, even though technically those departments are housed in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, they do offer a BSc option as well. Uh, and then, in addition to all of the different majors that those departments offer, we also offer a number of joint programs. So that be, would be a situation where you could complete a degree from two different departments at the same time. And so you'd get a, a major, for example, in both, say, chemistry and physics, or both biology and biochemistry. And there's a number of programs along those lines as well. Great. So it looks like there's a lot of options for students to pick from within the Faculty of Science, one of our largest faculties on campus. Carter, this next question coming in is for you. Um, a student's wondering what a day in the life of a student looks like in your program. So if you could just reiterate your program and then kind of take us through what that looks like for you. 
Yeah, so like I said, I'm aiming towards the major in ocean sciences. Um, and so with that, I most of my courses um, have lab components. I reckon about like three out of the five courses that I take have lab components to that. Um, and normally what I do, I try to review um, kind of like if the PowerPoints that a professor is going to go over, um, I try to go over those the day before. That way I kind of have that in my head. Um, that way when I go to the lecture, um, I kind of have a vague idea of what's going on. Um, hopefully more than vague, but you know. <laughs> um, and then as the professor kind of goes through the topics, I fill in those notes. Um, and then after, I always make sure to spend, I try to do like at least, um, if it's a 50 minute lecture, I try to spend at least 50 minutes reviewing those notes and then going over the next day's notes as well. Um, and for my lab courses, like I said, about three out of five courses have labs. Um, it kind of varies per lab. Um, a lot of times there's a pre-lab that I have to do. Um, so like similar to reviewing for a lecture, um, I would kind of go over my lecture notes and fill in the pre-lab and kind of make sure that I know the policies, the safety procedures that's going to happen in that lab. Um, and then I just kind of go through that lab and then I'll have the lab report after that that I'll have to do. It's not a terrible amount of work um, on average, but, you know, they vary lab to lab and, co and course to course. And so for you, Carter, a typical day, I know it can vary, but when you wake up in the morning, what would you say you tend to tend to go through in terms of, uh, you know, in high school, you're going to be getting up, you're going to be going class, 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 class all day long, um, and then going home at the end. What does that look like for a university student? Yeah, so I have a, like, there's my schedule. I try to put it together as much as possible, but oftentimes there's could be chunks. It could be an hour or two hours between courses. And so if there's anything that I need to work on, like long term projects or something, I'll kind of fill that in in the meantime, always making sure to kind of grab lunch whenever I can, because <laughs> that's important. But um, yeah, um, there can be breaks. It's different than high school where everything's all at once and then you have time kind of before and after. Um, but I kind of just try to fill in the work that I said in between those things wherever I can. Awesome. Kind of filling in those gaps with extra work and that kind of thing to keep on the ball for the next day. Great. So our next question is about what courses folks need to take in order to do a Bachelor of Science in high school. I think that's for Dr. Sullivan there. Hey. Sure. Uh, really, the the courses that you take in high school won't necessarily are not they're not a a critical determining factor in what you take for a bachelor of science because you could have virtually no science background at the high school level, and you can still come into Memorial and we still have lots of courses that are directed at students who don't have a strong background in a particular science discipline, take those courses and still put yourself on the road to eventually getting a Bachelor of Science. Well, that being said, the stronger your background, your background from high school, inevitably, the more that's going to help and it may expedite your, you on your way to being able to declare your major and then to get your science degree. Uh, so certainly, I'd encourage any student who's thinking about a science degree, uh, make sure you got uh, a grade 12 math done. Uh, ideally advanced math, but an academic math is okay too. Uh, do some uh, some some uh, level three or grade twelve science courses as well. Uh, the 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 courses that tend to be the best determinant uh, of how you're going to do in a science program will be the classic sciences, physics and and biology and chemistry. But other sciences are also very valuable, and an earth science or an earth systems course a geography course. These are all uh, great backgrounds to have, especially depending on what you think you might be interested in at the university level. Ultimately, there's no choice you can make at the high school level that's going to close any doors at the university level. It might mean that certain paths are, are a little bit longer than certain others, but you're always gonna have options when you come to Memorial. Absolutely. And just to note there, folks, the general admission requirements is what you would have to meet in order to gain entry into the university. Um, so that would be English, lab science, social studies, 
uh, math and an elective. Overall 70 average in those uh, course subject areas and Jennifer's going to put that in the chat there just in case you want to take a look at uh, the specifics for your area as it might be broken down. Alrighty, and so our next question again for Carter is how you um, manage work life balance and keep everything from piling up, but also still manage to have fun as a student on our campus. Yeah, it can be hard sometimes, I'll admit. <laughs> um, but um, what I'd say, like study groups are your best friend, and it's kind of a good way to get kind of both done at the same time, kind of your social life. You can study with friends, um, and inevitably there comes to a point where you could be sitting in the library for three hours and then you just can't learn anymore. And then so you're already with those friends. It's a great opportunity to go out, have a break, and then come back and then do that. Um, it's not... I don't find it terribly hard to strike a sort of work life balance in terms of, you know, student work and kind of having a life outside of that. But um, it can certainly be a struggle depending on like what program you're in. And the best thing I'd say is, you know, just get involved in some student societies, um, you know, hang out with them and you're going to meet like tons of like minded people that are taking the same courses as you and are likely in the exact same thread. So you're gonna have the same time off and the same breaks. And so you can catch lunch together, you can do whatever you want, but yeah. Yeah, and just to add to that, I was a science student too, and there are so many different societies. We, I was a part of the psychology society. I was a psych major. Um, each of the academic units usually have a, a society that's student involved and really active on campus. So if you're getting involved in those and reaching out for that peer support is really awesome. So our next question's about if you apply to a computer science major, but don't get into the program, what are their other options? Can they complete another major while having computer science related courses already completed? Yeah, so any uh, major in the Faculty of Science will have at least certain minimum requirements. And so the general minimum requirements for all of our programs would be uh, two critical reading and writing courses, of which at least one has to be English, two math courses, and two courses in each of two sciences other than mathematics. Beyond that, some of our programs will have additional requirements as well, and computer science uh, is one of those where it will have uh, so some of them may have specific courses that you'll need to have completed before you can apply to that major. Some may have a specific average that you need to have completed, and in some cases, possibly both. Ultimately, any courses that you take are going to be applicable to a Bachelor of Science degree. Because even if you do wind up taking, say, a computer science course, and it winds up not being specifically required for the program that you do wind up taking, it's always going to count as a science elective. And one of the requirements for the Bachelor of Science is that in total, you have to have 78 credit hours. So that's, a, for, for, mo for most people, that's 26 courses. Most courses are three credit hours. So you've got to have 26 courses in science generally. And that would include your major courses. It includes those core requirements I described a moment ago, but it might also include just other science courses that you've taken, whether out of general interest or because you thought you were going to go towards one program and then wound up going towards another, they'll always count towards your degree. And your degree in total is going to be at least 120 credit, credit hours. So for most of us, again, that's usually 40 courses, and they'll count towards that too. So it's really, it's really, really hard to waste a course. Even if it's not specifically required of a program that you wind up completing, it's still going to be part of that general pool of electives, which makes up your Bachelor of Science degree. Okay, thanks for that. Our next question is about how lectures are structured. So how are lectures structured to help students in larger classes? Are there any office hours or extra help uh, sessions? I think I'll ask Dr. Sullivan to weigh in on that one. Sure, and, and it can vary. So every faculty member uh, does offer office hours. So this is part of our contract with the university. Uh, and the number of office hours varies depending on how many courses we teach. 
So every instructor, and this isn't just true for, lar for instructors of large classes, will offer multiple office hours a week, where in a non-pandemic situation, you could go and knock on their door and go in and sit down and have a chat with them. But even in the current remotely delivered situation, we're all still finding different ways, whether that's through a platform like WebEx or even just over the telephone. There are still opportunities to connect with your instructors uh, at, at specific scheduled times throughout the week. So that's true for any course. For the larger courses in particular, uh, it will depend. Sometimes there will be help centers. Uh, many, several of our departments, uh, mathematics, for example, offer help centers where you can go, whether again in person or now virtually, uh, to get assistance. Uh, sometimes there may be additional, uh, uh, you'll hear them referred to as labs, even though they're not truly labs, they're tutorial sessions associated with a course. It varies from discipline to discipline, depending on the type of work that's involved in that course. Uh, and depending on what that particular department has found works best from, you know, probably the many, many years of offering that course. Uh, but if nothing else, yes, your instructor is always going to be there, is always going to be available. So you can reach out to them in an office hour, send them email, uh, lots of ways to, to contact an instructor. And I can speak from personal experience that the vast majority of faculty members love to hear from their students. They love to hear questions and comments about how the course is going. So no student should ever hesitate to reach out to their to their instructor if they have any questions or comments or concerns. Sounds like there's lots of supports there put in place for students to succeed. And it's really important recognizing that that need early to, to reach out and get that support, no matter what faculty it is you're choosing. Um, our next question is about the tips, what tips you could provide for easily transitioning from high school to university. Carter, might you be able to weigh in on that one? Yeah, definitely. So this is something that I was worried about, like firsthand switching from high school to university, because you hear like, I don't know if your high school teachers do it to like freak you out or something. <laughs> but like, honestly, the biggest change that I um, notice is the pace. Things are a lot faster of a pace. Obviously, in high school, things last, uh, you know, um, where I was the whole year, right? Whereas in high school or in university, rather, it's four months. So that's your entire course you have to learn in four months. And that's what I was nervous about. But like Dr. Sullivan just said, there's tons of help centers, office hours, everything like that. Um, and so kind of the biggest difference that I noticed was just the pace and kind of keeping up with that pace. But the biggest tip that I would have is, like I said before, if you get involved in the student societies, there's um, students that are higher, you know, more into their degree than you are. that can kind of give you tips on how what works best for biochemistry or biology, because they're all different paces and that have their own ways of doing things. And sometimes you have to memorize courses. Sometimes you just have to learn formulas. So it's very different depending on what you're doing. So, you know, find somebody that's already been through that. that can kind of walk you through the steps that work for them. Yeah, and I'm hearing it's an individualized kind of process and you can kind of take tips and tricks from different people. And certainly senior students are one of the best resources to younger students, just being able to be that wealth of knowledge and having been in our shoe in your shoes um, just a couple of years ago, probably. Um, so our next question is for Dr. Sullivan. It's about academic advising and how early a prospective student can get in touch with an academic advisor within the Faculty of Science in order to start their course planning. As early as you want. Uh, really, you know, I've had over the years, I've been senior faculty advisor for almost a decade now, and I've had students in grade 11 contact me and wonder, you know, I'm already starting to think about my, you know, the, my, my plans at university. Can you help steer me towards, you know, some good courses that might be suitable, that kind of thing. But at the same time, you don't need to put that much pressure on yourself. Uh, one excellent resource that the university has is our first year information guide. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you'll see the, the, the URL posted now in the chat, but it's just www.mon.ca slash FYI. And what that does is it gathers together all of the information that's going to be pertinent 
to an incoming student, a prospective student, or a new first year student. So it, it it's much more manageable than the university calendar, which has all of our regulations and all of our courses. It brings together, well, if I'm interested in a certain program, what courses should I take in my first year? What are gonna be the admissions requirements for that program? What courses would I be able to take uh, as an elective that I wouldn't have to worry about having you know three years worth of prerequisites fulfilled and that kind of thing. So that guide is a fantastic first step if you have any questions about course planning, degrees, anything like that. But if it doesn't seem to answer a question at any point, whether you are, as I say, you know, still, you know, only partway through your high school years, or whether you're deep into your your first or your second year and you're getting close to declaring a major, but you still have a question, reach out to me. Or if it's something that's about that's very particular to a program, that's where all of those individual departmental advisors can also be uh, be very helpful. Uh, so if it's something that's really specific about a degree in ocean sciences, for example, well, Danielle Nichols is going to know a little bit more about that than I would. But so you could contact her directly. But if you're not sure, well, send it to me first. And if I know the answer, I'll help you. If I don't, I will be quite happy to pass you along to Danielle. You know, ultimately, if you've got questions ask. Nobody's going to look down on you for asking questions. In fact, we, 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 in general, we view students who ask questions as students who are clearly, you know, very interested and very, very engaged with their degree. That's only a good thing. And there really are no such things as dumb questions. Any question you have, anything you're not sure about, that's something worth asking about. Awesome. And folks, just to remind you, we're using the Q&A feature to all panelists to submit those questions that you have. So next up, we are wondering what are the undergraduate options for students interested in data science and statistics? Dr. Sullivan, can you weigh in on that for us? Absolutely. Uh, a couple of options there. Uh, the major in statistics is a program offered by the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. Uh, so that would be one option. And then the programs in computer science. Uh, if you're interested in data science, doing a degree in computer science is a great way uh, to get a good undergraduate education and preparation in that discipline as well. Uh, and then you can specialize in data science specifically at the graduate level if, if you're interested in going on and doing further education beyond your undergraduate degree. So statistics or a computer science uh, major, those would be both excellent preparation for data science in general. Perfect. Next up, we have a question for Carter. Uh, students wondering, is there anything that you wish you had known uh, that you know now, but you wish you had known back in your first year? What that might be? Um, two things. One, as a kind of joke, it snows a lot in St. John's, so maybe <laughs> fuzzy socks. <laughs> um, and a, a, another thing, uh, I wish I had known how much help there was going to be. Like I said, like a lot of times, like at least in my high school, like kind of seemed like the pre the teachers were trying to like psych you out and like almost tell you not to do it. But like, there's so much help there, and like, don't don't be scared to ask for help. Nobody's gonna look down on you for it. There's tons of people that want to see you succeed. Nobody doesn't want to see you succeed. Um, and there's like, if there's a problem that you're having, I guarantee you somebody else has had it. Ask around somebody can help you through it for sure that's great advice carter and our last question here um is about the differences between earth science and geography and what the process is to change your major after the first year sure i can tackle that one uh, so to the first point there earth science is more of a and of course, there are always overlaps between almost any two science disciplines. There, there are very few hard divides left in the scientific world. Uh, being interdisciplinary is becoming more and more common and more and more encouraged, uh, which is one of the reasons why those joint programs I mentioned uh, earlier in, in, in the session uh, can be very appealing and very attractive to students. Uh, Earth sciences tends to be a bit more laboratory based, a bit more on the hard science end of things, uh, there's a bit more often of a, of a physics or a chemistry component to the to the kinds of studies that are done there. 
Whereas geography can be much more of a uh, can lean much more towards the the more social sciences end end of things. And there's a big spectrum there as to how much of a social science it becomes or how much of a of a hard science uh, it might be. Uh, to the other question, uh, the process to change a major is really no different from declaring a major in the first place. So it depends on what you want your new major to be. If it's something where there are a number of requirements uh, and where it, the entry may be limited and competitive, then you would have to apply for that and go into that competition the same way you would if you had no previous program declared. Whereas if it's a non-competitive program, it's as simple as just filling out a, a, a program change form, getting the appropriate signatures, and there you go, you're done. You know, something that's always really important to bear in mind is that you're never locked into a program at the university. And, and, and I think one of the, the things that worries students coming into the university is the sense that they, they may feel that they need to already have their entire academic journey charted out and know exactly what degree they want to do, what major they want to declare. And it's just not true. And one of the big changes, you know, getting back to one of the questions Carter addressed earlier, you know, one of the big changes I find going from high school to, the, to university is just the sheer breadth of choice you've got is so much bigger at the university level. You can do programs and you can do courses in university that you wouldn't even think of in high school. And it's important to give yourself the freedom to explore some of those options. If you come into university and you know exactly what you want to do, and that's what you do, and you enjoy it and you succeed in it, that's wonderful. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with coming into the university without a good sense of what you want to do and figuring that out, or coming in thinking that you want to do a certain program and then discovering eventually that, no, actually, my, my, my interest is now really in some other program or even some other degree entirely. And having the, giving yourself the freedom to explore all of those options and potentially to change your program, maybe more than once, which lots of people do, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And the university very much supports that through our procedures and through our academic, academic advising as well. It's so true. So many students change their mind. I was one of them. I changed my mind three times in my undergraduate degree before I finally settled on on the option that was right for me. And I'm really glad I kept exploring until I got to that point where I was really satisfied with my choice. So folks, lots of exploration to be had when you come to university. Um, I noticed we're ending, we're nearing the end of our time today. So I just want to ask you both if you have any last tips or tricks for our incoming prospective students, folks. Dr. Sullivan, I'll start with you. All I would say, you know, is just to repeat that idea, you know, explore, ask questions. There's lots of help available at the university, but the help is not going to come to you. You've got to decide to take advantage of the resources that are available to you. So don't ever hesitate to do that. Come talk to us, connect with us on WebEx, send us questions by email, whatever mechanism works best for you, we'll, we're more than happy to help. Great. And Carter, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, like, don't be afraid to ask for help and, like, get involved. Kind of the last question I just saw pop up a couple seconds ago. Um, like, anybody can join any society. You don't need to be declared in that program or anything. Like, I'm, like I've done a couple things with a couple societies just because I've taken one course and I really enjoyed it. Um, and there's tons of, like, peer tutoring. Um, like events just to like mix and mingle and meet other people. There's tons of different options. Don't be afraid to like reach out, ask for help, or just kind of hang out with other people that are going through the same thing as you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Sullivan and Carter and all the folks watching for joining us today. If you have any other questions at all, feel free to reach out to us at admissions at mun.ca. If you'd want to stay connected with us, you certainly can by filling out our request for information form on the front page of our website at mun.ca slash undergrad. Be sure to check out our next session as well with the Faculty of Nursing on Thursday, November 26th at 4 p.m. Newfoundland time. We also have a virtual open house up and coming that folks are going to be able to get more information, uh, chat with current students, chat with the faculty. So definitely um, check that out as well.
All right, that's all for me, folks. Have a great rest of your day and take good care.